Here we go. As you heard. Well, good afternoon, Sam. Um, and good thank afternoon, you for your time. It's a, <laughs> and it's a Sunday afternoon, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for, for having you know, me. <clears throat> You know, as I mentioned, I've been working on a book for the last uh, three years, and there's so much of you in the book. Your, you know, I've obviously read your. Um, Sounds like an obituary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your uh, malignant uh, self love narcissism revisited. She have to mirror you and say the way you say. Um, Indeed. But I've also watched, you know, so many of your seminars and. So you're in my head a lot. So my apologies. I've got to this, well, that's okay. We'll we'll let you off this time. But <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. the author, the author that I've been working with suggested <clears throat> that I do an interview with you, and I thought that would really be uh, a, a, a really good idea. And you know what I didn't do in the other ones was ask you about what you've been doing. I mean, you're a, a pioneer in this field. You've been doing it a long time. You've written books. You've you know, you've had a YouTube channel for a long time. You've also, you know, write about, write about the role in uh, Cronons in Time Asymmetry, which, of course, I helped you with. Um, so maybe you can uh, tell us about yourself, Sam. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a professor of psychology, author of uh, books. I don't think we should focus on me. Let's focus on my work. It's, I think, hopefully more interesting. I mean, sort of in terms of all the, you know, for the law, I think you started doing this in 1994, 95. So yes, I, 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 mean, well, I, was the I was the first to, um, to own a website on narcissism in 1995, and I've been alone for nine years. The second website opened in 2004. I also ran the first six support groups for victims of narcissistic mm -hmm. abuse. Narcissistic abuse is a phrase that I coined in 1995. And at that time, I also coined the entire language that is in use today. Well, 90, 99% of it that is in use today. So people don't even realize that I, I coined um, flying monkeys and <laughs> you know mm. this, kind, mm. this kind of things. Yes. Um, cerebral narcissists, somatic narcissists, narcissistic <clears throat> abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And then I borrowed terms from so the early psychoanalytic schools of, of uh, thought in psychology. So, for example, I borrowed the term narcissistic supply mm -hmm. and I redefined it in the way that it is used today. Um, originally in the 1930s, narcissistic supply had meant the <coughs> relationship between essentially selfish, unavailable parents and their children. Mm. Um, but I redefined it completely, and the way it is used today is any form of external input which a narcissist uses to regulate his internal environment, his cognitions, mm -hmm. his emotions, his moods, mm -hmm. etc. So that's that's a common. So I, I I did I also took I I borrowed many many terms. I borrowed, for example, the true self and false self from Donald Winnicott, mm. Winnicott's work, and again I redefined them to apply specifically to narcissism. Because in Winnicott's work, they don't necessarily apply to narcissism. Actually, they apply to developmental psychology. I borrowed the, the cycle of, of the narcissist. So that's idealization, evaluation. And I added to it two phases, discard and replacement, et cetera, et cetera. So I had, I had to single-handedly come up with the whole discipline because there was nobody there. And there was no language to communicate these highly idiosyncratic experiences, highly, highly personal. It's a little like a mystical experience. How do you communicate a mystical experience? It's like, how do you communicate? Yes. How do you communicate an experience of narcissistic abuse yeah. in the absence mm. of a language? Mm. Of a language. No language. Yeah. Love you one second. Yeah. Turn on the lights. So there was simply no, no language. And, and then when, the, when, when I came up with the language, which took about two years, suddenly people had a way of, of sharing <clears throat> their experiences and mm. actually sharing the, their experiences first and foremost with themselves. In other words, becoming aware. And so they became aware and then they, they formed like-minded groups and they discussed these issues in these groups, et cetera, et cetera. And for nine years, I was doing all this alone. And, and then in 2004, 
people discovered there's money in it and the avalanche started as simple as that and then youtube came i had the first youtube channel on narcissism i still have and and many others entered the field i i'm not quite sure that it's been a beneficial process because the word had been the word narcissism had been debased and and bandied around mm. in all the wrong ways it became a pejorative or <laughs> a curse word and many, many people who had entered the field are totally unqualified. <coughs> they are distributing misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And many of them, even with academic degrees, even with advanced academic degrees, and even with advanced academic degrees in psychology, are not experts in narcissism. Psychology is a giant field. You need, you need you know, and they are not. They simply are not. So they, there's a commercial there's a commercial corruption of, of the whole thing, which had reached monumental, mm. monumental proportions. There are tens of millions mm. of members of support groups for narcissistic abuse. And what I'm hearing online is, is <clears throat> blood, blood curdling, absolutely spine chilling. <laughs> the, I would say that for every one correct bit of information, precise bit, something that relies on studies and research and, mm. For every one, there's about 99 that are wrong. And some of them are dead wrong. Wow. Some of them are dead wrong, like exactly the opposite of what. But there is demonization of narcissists. So you need yeah. to demonize them. Yeah. And you have this stupid list. Yeah. You have this stupid list, like 10 things you need, you need to know about this and 10 things you need to know about that. And you have, of course, all kinds of wild, wild outgrowths and uh, a movement of essentially covert narcissists who call themselves empaths and super empaths, empaths yes and so on. <laughs> they are definitely yeah. narcissistic people they're grandiose mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. like everything else like everything else the internet had not been good ultimately if i have to look book and i'm the oldest i'm the oldest guy in the block i invented the block if i if yeah. i if i look back no it's not <clears> been beneficial it's not I I think all in all, it had there was more damage than, than help, in my view. The vast majority of people get stuck in the victimhood phase. They they adopt a victimhood as a, as a form of identity, and they can't progress. Yeah. They can't break out. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam, what is your your own fascination with with the subject? Because you obviously find it so fascinating. It, it's so interesting to you. What is your interest? Your well, it started with the fact that I've been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder twice. But mm -hmm. I've progressed a lot more since then in my perception of narcissism. I think mm -hmm. narcissism is an organizing principle of, of modern civilization and also an explanatory hermeneutic principle, a principle that allows us to make sense of life and the environment and so on. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think narcissism is a form of religion, actually, um, a missionary religion. I think narcissists are trying to convert non-narcissists to their religion, and very successfully so. I think um, I think narcissism is um, um, embedded now inextricably in social institutions and structures, mm -hmm. in in careers in dating, in, uh, in uh, relationships, intimate relationships. Uh, it, it, had come, it had come to be modern civilization. So it's now much, much wider field, much wider field. So, you know, we analyze politicians, we ask, are they narcissists? When we, yeah. see, when we see all kinds, I am hard pressed to come across a movie or a book which doesn't include the word narcissism or narcissist. Hard pressed, I'm, I'm serious. I watch movies, yeah. I read books, and there's always at the end or in the middle or in the beginning somewhere, there's the word narcissist, narcissism, and so on. So people make sense of the world through this. There's been a series, a television series called In Treatment. <coughs> it's about a therapist. Now the series yes, is... I know, it, I know it well, yes. Yeah, it's a wonderful series. And it's three seasons. Yes. It's three seasons. Yes. Now it may come as a shock to you, even though you had watched it. It may come as a shock to you. In the entire series, there's no mention of depression, no mention of borderline personality disorder, no mention mm. of any clinical label 
except one, narcissistic personality disorder. And it appears in the series eight times. NPD is mentioned eight times in, in treatment to the exclusion of all other labels. I mean, you witness depression, you witness patients with borderline personality mm -hmm. disorder, but no clinical label is used except NPD. And that's eight times. That tells you a lot. This is a hot button topic in academia. Uh, it, it <clears throat> brings me to my next point. I emailed um, one of the top universities in South Africa, the head of psychology, and I said, who specializes in narcissistic personality disorder and narcissistic abuse? No one. And, you know, the Sam, I, the, the person that I was involved with, uh, who was a, a, a covert somatic narcissist, often accused me of being a narcissist. And in those days, I thought, well, okay, maybe she's trying to say I'm a little bit grandiose or self-centered. I didn't know what the word meant. And I think if we look at, for example, the concept of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's been around since 1935. Everybody knows if you have a drinking problem, that's the, way, the place to go. But here is a different story. It's only come to the fore in the last 20, 30 years. So what this means is, and I, this is my own experience and with many people that I've spoken to, is there's nowhere to go. And that when the, the, the victim, and I use the word victim uh, in inverted commas, because I know what you're saying about becoming a victim, I, I get it, um, is further traumatized by the therapist who often misdiagnose the narcissist and the narcissist probably has manipulated the therapist too. <laughs> so that was also my experience. So, you know, the, 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 when you say has your, you feel maybe your work hasn't been beneficial, but to me it has been. And you are forever in my head. I can't get you out of my head. So it's been very beneficial to me. No, no, and let, let that's, in that's why I, as I said, I wanted to do this because I thought having it straight from you, I've, you, you're quoted quite a lot of times in the book. But I think that if we go back to the basics and we say um, there is a difference between a narcissistic traits, narcissistic style, narcissistic personality disorder, the disorder is on a spectrum. Most benign form of narcissism to malignant narcissism and then to psychopathy. So maybe you can tell us about the difference between the traits, the style and the disorder itself. First of all, we are in a period of uh, transition. There are powerful voices in academia and outside academia which dispute the very existence of narcissism as a clinical entity or a clinical construct. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the book that defines mental health for, for the rest of the world, with the exception of North America, it's known as ICD, edition 11, the 11th edition of ICD, which is International Classification of Diseases. So the ICD, for example, had eliminated this diagnosis. <clears throat> it actually eliminated all personality disorders and had come instead with a single personality disorder with different emphasis, which had been, which had, which is what I had been advocating since 1997. Absolutely. I, I agree. I, I don't think there should be different. I think people switch and oscillate between a variety of what today is are considered to be separate diagnoses. And I think narcissists as well gravitate and, and oscillate and vacillate between of being an overt narcissist and then suddenly <laughs> they become covert and then they <laughs> go back to being overt and they're somatic one day, one day and cerebral the next. There's no type constancy. <laughs> There's no type constancy because narcissists collapse. They fail. So if you're cerebral and you fail, for example, you fail to impress people with your intellectual prowess and and pyrotechnic intelligence, you fail mm. and you become somatic because you need supply and you don't care where you, where you get it. So you become somatic and you mm. use sex and whatever is left of your body to try to obtain supply. It's the same with overt and covert. It's if you fail as an overt, if no one pays attention to you or, or they ridicule you when you try to, then you become covert. You become a seething, passive aggressive, envious creature. So, <laughs> We already know that there's no type constancy, and we're beginning to think that we have completely misconstrued the whole field. We believe, increasingly believe today, that what we used to call overt narcissists, the in-your-face, dare, daring-do, 
Donald Trump type, type narcissist. Yeah. yeah. He's actually a psychopath. <clears throat> we are beginning to, to think that it's actually a psychopath. We definitely are increasingly, we increasingly consider borderline personality disorder to be a form of psychopathy. So it all seems to kind of gravitate towards a mega concept of psychopathy. Covert narcissists, on the other hand, are compensatory. So we, we begin to, to think that narcissism is a compensatory style. At the core of the narcissist, mm -hmm. there is insecurity, if a sense of inferiority, a perception mm -hmm. of inadequacy, feeling as a bit unworthy object. And so to, to cover up for this, to compensate for this, and develop grandiose fantasies, and whether you can accomplish these fantasies or not, is immaterial, because you inhabit these fantasies. You live within the fantasy. You had renounced reality, even when you're overt. Narcissists renounce reality. Otto Kernberg was the first to suggest in 1975 that narcissism and borderline are actually forms of psychosis. And so mm. narcissists in, in mm. many ways are psychotic. Absolutely, they confuse external reality with internal reality in many ways. And so they, they live in, in fantasy land. The only thing, the only, the only problem there is that as opposed to, psych, to psychotics, they try to bring you into the fantasy. They are coercive. Psychotics are not coercive. Psychotics just confuse right. the internal with the external. But the right. narcissist, narcissist insists that you confirm and affirm that his fantasy is not a fantasy, that it's a reality. If he considers himself to be a genius, he wants you to tell him that he's a genius. And this is called narcissistic supply. And when the narcissist is frustrated, he definitely becomes aggressive. And if he's overt, he switches to psychopathy. So he becomes antisocial. Mm. Um, and so we're beginning to see a melding of all this. Now, there are powerful voices such as Judith, Judith, Judith Herman, and less powerful voices such as Sam Vakni, who suggest that all these disorders are actually post-traumatic conditions. They are forms, they are forms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. These, these had been used to be mutilated, abused children. And they adopted a series of strategies to cope with the abuse and the trauma in early childhood. And one of these strategies is known as narcissism. So narcissism can be easily reconceived as a stunted, frozen child who yeah. is, a, is in a post-traumatic state. Yeah. And then if this is the, is the case, it's good news because we know how to treat trauma very effectively, but we don't know how to treat personality disorders at all. We fail repeatedly and consistently with most of them, if not all of them, but we do know to treat trauma so if we just change the way we look at narcissism, maybe there's hope, maybe there's healing. My work on cold therapy is a harbinger of this, but I don't believe I'm the last word. And so it's very difficult when you talk about victims. First of all, I, I, as you know, I make a distinction between having been victimized and being a victim. Being a victim is an identity. Yes. Being a victim is yes. identity politics. Having been victimized is a fact. And so when we talk about victims, it becomes very, very fraught and problematic because if you perceive narcissists as people who are in a post-traumatic condition, then they are victims. It's just- Of, one, that, of that abuse, yeah. So, so it's just one type of victim victimizing another type of victim. It changes the whole yeah. mental picture. It's, it's like hurt people hurt people, you know? But Sam, here, here's the thing. <clears throat> when, when I left this person, I didn't know who and what she was. I had 20 years of psychotherapy behind me, luckily, and I'd studied psychology. I'm not a professor like you, but I'd, I'd studied. So I watched, I got all, most of the psychodynamics. I saw the victim mentality. I saw the COVID aggression, the lack of responsibility. The thinking that was so odd to me, I thought there was brain damage. I honestly thought there was some because it didn't make any sense. So I left the person and then I figured out, then it led me to, you know, to narcissism. But what I realized was that, and it made me very uncomfortable in the beginning, I shared so much with her. I realized we come from the same place which supports what you are saying. 
so much of our stuff was the same that made me think, am I a narcissist? Is this possible? <laughs> so it's like being coming from the same place, flip sides of the, of the same coin. I went one way and the, per, the other person went in a different trajectory right. and her uh, mother and uh, aunt are narcissists and her grandmother's a narcissist. So there's the genetic component. And then there's the, the environmental, uh, the environment part as well. So, and I think getting to the victim thing that, that certainly I, when I came out of it, I was very broken. I couldn't remember things. I couldn't sleep, you know, all of those, you've heard this a lot, I'm sure from, but, but then I realized that, that I was in control of what I was going to do to keep away from the person. And I can still hear you saying no contact. If they, if you, if they send you gifts, return them unopened. If they come to your door, call the police. I can hear you saying that. So I really implemented that and I shut the person down. But so I took back control. And what I often hear from people is um, the narcissist hypnotized me and I was powerless. And I thought that's, that's not right because each of us has the power to say no to whatever it is. And that often um, it was kind of almost like that, you know, that there was nothing that, that the victim could do. And I, and I found that to be a, a problem. Whereas I felt, well, I, I, I'm, I can, I can take back my power and the empath thing that you mentioned, and this I got from you years ago, that if I demonize narcissists, and I say they're all good, all bad, and I'm all good. It's then I'm the same. Yes, it's, it's yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I realized that in my relationship with this person, was I all good, Sam? Was I? Of course, I wasn't. But I have to take responsibility for. So that's what I. That's what I see is that the power is handed over to the to the narcissistic abuser, and the person is helpless. And that is the victim dynamic that you are referring to. And also the addiction, uh, the fellowship of, it's called the SLAA, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, was formed, I think, in about 40 years ago. It's a St. Augustine Fellowship. And that's when people came to realize that there is something I was made aware of that 20 years ago. So I knew that it wasn't just the, per the, the, the somatic narcissist addicting me. I also have that addiction. So it was taking two again not just the other person i think um we can go to the meta level and see the dynamic between the narcissist and his typical victim because there are atypical victims but the typical mm -hmm. victim. it's a faustian deal the narcissist <laughs> the narcissist offers you um, a chance to experience maternal unconditional love and that is the love bombing and grooming phase. And so there the narcissist says, you're, he idealizes you. He says, you're perfect, you're amazing, you're the most intelligent thing, the best thing that ever happened to me. I've never come across someone like you. You're, you're changing mm. me. You're changing me. You're omnipotent. You're... Mm. So he talks to you as a mother would, as a mother would to, a, to her child. Mothers idealize their children, otherwise they wouldn't be able to suffer them. <laughs> children are insufferable unless you idealize them. So mothers, <laughs> nature endowed mothers with the ability yeah. to overlook, to overlook the, um, the nuisance that children are and to idealize them. The narcissist does the same to you. He idealizes you. <laughs> of course, by, by idealizing you, by idealizing you, the narcissist idealizes himself. So it's core idealization. But you experience it as unconditional maternal love, which all, that's the elixir of life. That's the holy grail. That's what we all seek in all our relationships. The mother bond with the child. Sorry yes. to interrupt. The mother yes. bond with the child. It's a second chance. It's a second chance because the vast majority mm. of us grow up with mothers who are less than, less than perfect. Not good enough mothers. Mothers who are absent, who are selfish, who are tired, who are angry. Who are... We all have this, this baggage of not good enough mothering. And here's the nurse. Here nurse comes and says, I'm going to give you a childhood back, and this time it's going to work. This time it's going to be perfect. And mm. now, now I'm going to be your mother, and I'm going to love you unconditionally. I'm going to idealize you. And moreover, I'm going to give you, grant you access 
to your own idealized image in my eyes, through my gaze. So you can see yourself idealized through the narcissist's gaze. That's extremely addictive because it's the first time you experience unadulterated self-love. Narcissi the narcissist's gift to you is the ability to self-love, but an idea, a false self. The narcissist creates for you an impromptu false self, a small false self, and tells you, mm -hmm. you can fall in love with this false self of yours. I'm granting mm -hmm. you access to this false self of yours. And you can finally self-love safely in my ambit, because I'm your mother, mm -hmm. and I love you unconditionally. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, once he got you addicted, he withdraws. He simply withdraws. He insists then that you do the same for him. He wants you to, to serve as a mother figure. And by the way, this is regardless of gender. It's a, it's a universal yeah. thing. He mm -hmm. wants you then to mother him. <clears throat> but then, of course, if you mother him and he mothers you, a concept which I call dual mothership, and if he gives you access to this hall of mirrors where you see multiple reflections of your idealized self and you fall in love with these reflections, you get addicted to them then he has infinite power over you. He has infinite. He can withdraw your self-love by, by denying you access to this hall of mirrors, yeah. by blocking this idealizing. And he can become a bad mother. He can withdraw his maternal, unconditional love and acceptance, which would yeah. be excruciatingly painful. So he strikes a deal with you. You're going to suspend yourself. You're going to kill yourself mentally. You're going to die. And on this condition that you agree to die mentally, he will guarantee you access to all these goodies. And, and the vast majority of people accept the deal. They die. And they become an internal object. They become what we call in psychology an introject. They are, the narcissist takes a snapshot of you, photoshops the snapshot. That's the process of idealization and then proceeds to interact with the snapshot. Why? Because the snapshot is safe. The snapshot will never abandon the narcissist, will never challenge, yeah. disagree, yeah. criticize, whatever. That, in <clears> other <throat> words, the snapshot provides total control. But you, your part of the deal is to never deviate from the snapshot. But how can you never deviate from the snapshot if you cease <laughs> to exist? Yeah. To never deviate <laughs> To never deviate from a static representation of you, you must become static. You must die, in effect. So when you, when you begin to show signs of independence, autonomy, agency, self-efficacy, when you make decisions, when you have new friends, when you travel, when you study, you are threatening the snapshot and you are breaching the contract with the narcissist because you gradually diverge from the snapshot. And so the narcissist regards you as, an, as a threat to the internal balance in his mind. You, you become a threat, you become a persecutory object. In short, you become an enemy. Hence, hence the devaluation and discard phase. Yeah. This is, this is the relationship with the narcissist in a nutshell. Now, one more comment and I'll let you go. <laughs> um, I tend to hog the limelight, of course. So, <laughs> Well, it's fascinating. Point. So it's not, it's not a problem, Sam. It's fascinating. Uh, really one, fascinating. One more thing. You mentioned hypnosis or being hypnotized or people reporting this. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Actually, they have a point, ironically, <clears throat> or, or paradoxically, they do have a point. There is there have been recent discoveries in neuroscience about a phenomenon called entraining. This is a phenomenon studied over the last 15 years or 20, but had come to the forefront in the last 10 years. And we discovered, for example, that using music, we can create in your brain a replica of my brain. So when two people right. listen, when two people play the same music, their brains become utterly synchronized. And when I say utterly synchronized, the EEGs are indistinguishable. You can't tell whose brain is it. They become one brain. Now, the narcissist is used to this because of narcissistic supply. What the narcissist does, he takes your input, his input, her input, and he creates his mind. He recreates his mind on the fly. He uses this constant input 
to recreate his mind, and I call it the hive mind, the swarm mind. Yeah. It's a kaleidoscope, it's a, it's a, it's a collage. So the narcissist is used <clears throat> to the environment having a determining effect on his mind. His mind is formed and shaped by the environment on the fly. So he's used to that. So what he does, he entrains you. He actually replicates his mind in yours, literally. Literally, he synchronizes the brain waves through entrainment. But then the question is, how does he do it? You don't, not all, not all couples play music together. So how, how does he succeed to do that? Well, there is a form of music that the narcissist uses to accomplish this. It's called verbal abuse. Verbal abuse has all the characteristics of music. It has repetitive refrains. It has cadence. Right. It has cadence. It has tempo. It has rhythm. It has harmony. It has melody. Verbal abuse is music. It's exactly like rap or hip hop. It's music. It's a musical style. I can actually take a verbal abuse session, put it online, and people will think it's music. So he uses verbal abuse to entrain you, to create in your mind, literally and physically, physiologically, a replica of the brainwaves in his mind. In this sense, it's very close to dissociative suggestive states, such as hypnosis. Now, the reason I agree with you that it doesn't, it doesn't justify victim passivity is mm -hmm. that in train, in training, in training takes place only during the abusive session. Once the session is over, you are de-entrained. You're no longer entrained. So then you regain, you regain self-control, autonomy, and you can make decisions. But during these intermittent reinforcement bullying sessions, you, yeah. are, ac you are actually um, passive and with, without uh, almost any control. And in this sense, you're hypnotized during this period yeah <clears throat> so sam if we go back to um the difference between narcissistic traits style and and what's currently called the disorder so the first, the, two, the first to suggest the first to suggest that there's a difference was a guy called lynn uh, lynn sperry and he suggested that there should be a distinction between people who have narcissistic style also known as assholes, and people who have mm. narcissistic personality disorder. Mm. Then Millen, Theodore Millen came into the scene, adopted Lynn Sperry's work. He cites Lynn Sperry in his seminal uh, book, uh, Personality Disorders in Modern Life. And so he adopted his work and he added another layer, the narcissistic personality. So now we have three layers. We have style, personality, and disorder. And the difference, is, difference between them is quantitative, literally, but quantity to the point that it becomes quality. So, for example, traits would be exaggerated. Lack of empathy would be more extreme. Behaviors mm -hmm. would be escalated. Uh, exploitation would be emphasized. Envy would be much stronger in, in the disorder. Antisocial behaviors are almost exclusive to the disorder, etc. So it's a, it's a matter of quantity. It's an exagger it's these are exaggerated forms of each other. The disorder, though, when you cross <clears> into <throat> the disorder, you are beginning to have several psychological and psychodynamic features which are absent from the style and from the personality. For example, you are no longer able to relate to other people as external. What you tend to do is a narcissist with a disorder you tend to internalize other people. You tend to create internal objects represent, which represent these people. And then you regard other people as figments of your mind, as extensions, which explains a lot of the abuse and a lot of the, because you, it's self, if he abuses, if I abuse you as a narcissist, it's self-inflicted because you're not there. You're in my mind, you're an internal object. Mm. So. I subject you to all the dynamics in my mind because you are a part of my mind. For example, my mother taught me to not have boundaries. I abuse means when the parent, parental figures or caregivers 
breach the child's boundaries. Don't allow the child yeah. to separate. Okay. So I am used to not having boundaries. But because you are part of my mind, I have no problem to breach your boundaries. I do to you that which was done to me. Because you are me. You are me. That is something victims can, can't wrap their, their, their heads around. I mean, so, so, and that's one example of, of, of a psychodynamic feature or psychological feature which clearly distinguishes uh, not, uh, the disorder from all. I would say that perhaps the second thing, with your permission, perhaps the second thing is where a lack of empathy crosses into sadism, antisocial behavior, um, the tendency to abuse in a way which is negating and vitiating of the victim. And that's why I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse to distinguish it from other types of abuse. Other types of abuse leverage some dimensions of your existence, financial abuse, legal abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, you name it, all of them leverage some aspect of you. Sexual abuse leverages usually your genitalia, you know? So it's a limited type of abuse. Narcissistic abuse is all pervasive, ubiquitous, and above all, the main goal and the only goal of narcissistic abuse is for you to cease to exist because your separateness constitutes a threat. And narcissists are not equipped to deal with separateness. They were never allowed to separate. So this is where this is where a lack of empathy in the disorder becomes extreme. I mean, <clears throat> I think that the word narcissist and narcissism, it, it's used very freely today. And I think I got this from you as well, that adolescence, for example, is a naturally narcissistic phase where the child is individuating, okay. uh, becomes God and saying to, my, it's saying to parents, uh, off you go. I'm, I'm becoming my own person. So this is healthy. Without some modicum of narcissism, we're not going to survive. Of course. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I've always thought of it the way I see it is, it's exactly what you're saying, that really what distinguishes the, the disorder from traits or style is that lack of emotional empathy. There is cognitive, as you've called it, cold empathy and interpersonal exploitation. Um, and if we, you've now, you know, we've spoken about narcissistic abuse, but so we have really four phases, which are not linear. So we have idealization, as you said, discard, sorry, devaluation, discard, and then the hoover. So do you want to take us through, through those, those phases, sir? Seeing as you can say it so much better than I can. <laughs> Hoovering is another term that I coined, by the way. <laughs> was that yours as well? I, yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. People, people don't, don't realize it. It's another term. I coined. Um, <clears throat> Before I go there, you see the language breaks down. Even for someone like you who is well versed in narcissism, the language breaks down because you use the term exploitation. Narcissists never exploit. I can't exploit you. You don't exist. You're part of me. Who am I exploiting? <laughs> from right. So from I'm taking uh, what's mine. My... I'm taking what's mine. I mean, right. So from my sick. perspective, yeah, yeah not yeah. from a narcissist perspective. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. I didn't see that a few years ago, but now I do. It, yes. it breaks. It breaks the mind. I mean, it's mind mind yeah. boggling. It's the yeah. mind can't function anymore because it's so alien. Narcissists are so alien in the way they yeah. perceive others or don't perceive others. <laughs> That's a, the core problem, by the way. Narcissists have no what we call object relations. The narcissist is stuck in a phase of development called self-relation. But he doesn't progress to object relation. Object relation simply means relating to others. And as a joke, it's very telling that in psychology, the word object means people, just for your information. So right. <laughs> object relations means relations with people. Yeah. Yes, yes. So psychology is very, very narcissistic field because if I regard yeah, it as it's a funny, you, yeah. It's funny you should say that. I'm just thinking that, yeah. yeah. Okay, so coming back to, to, your, to your question, when, the, which you asked when we were both a lot younger, about uh, idealization and, and so on and so forth. As I said, there's no, there's no, I've modified the concept of ideal, idealization, and now it should be called co-idealization, because the narcissist, by idealizing you, idealizes himself. If you are the most intelligent person on earth, 
and I'm with you, it says something about me. If you're, yeah. if if someone is the, if if someone is the most beautiful woman on earth and she chooses me or she is with me, it says something about me. So there's no there's no separate idealization. It's always core idealization. And actually, the main reason for idealization is the narcissist part. The narcissist wants to aggrandize and idealize himself. And the only way to do this is to aggrandize and idealize everyone around him. And that's why he does that. That's the first motivation. Second motivation, when I idealize you, it's irresistible to you. Because as I said, it's a form of maternal unconditional love and so on. But also who doesn't want to be thought of as super intelligent, amazingly beautiful and so on? It's irresistible, it's addictive. So uh, the, one of the, the second main function of core idealization is to get the victim or the prey or the target or the inter potential intimate partner addicted. So it creates addiction. Idealization lasts for as long as you don't diverge or deviate from the snapshot, from the introject. Because in the process of idealization, the narcissist creates an image of you, which is photoshopped. That's idealization. And then as long as you don't deviate or diverge from this image, everything is okay and you will continue to be idealized. As long as we behave. <laughs> as long as you're dead. Let's, right. let's call a spade right. a spade, as long as you're dead. Right, right. Because if I tell you, let's eat in this restaurant and you say, no, let's eat in that restaurant, you had diverged mm. from the snapshot. You had disagreed with me. It also implies some form of criticism. Your choice of restaurant is wrong. It also implies that yeah. you know something, implies that you know something that I don't know. So you're challenging right. my omniscience. Right. It's, if you tell me, listen, let me help you. It's, I don't interpret it as an indication or expression of love. I interpret it as an attempt to humiliate me, to imply yeah. that I'm not omnipotent, that I need yeah. you, that you have something I don't have. So even the most innocuous comments, most loving or will be perceived mm. as challenging or undermining the snapshot. You can't do anything right. Whatever you do will be perceived as an attempt to unsettle the precarious balance of the narcissist inner universe, and therefore will render you a persecutory object, an enemy. In other words, in other words, devaluation is inevitable the, as long as you show signs of life. It's inevitable. The victims should stop asking themselves, what did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? Should I have done this? Should I have done that? Should I not have said this? Should I? You would have been devalued, period. If you, if you eat and drink and breathe, it's sufficient for the narcissist to, to switch to the devaluation mode. The only way for you to have avoided devaluation is to have rendered yourself an ancient Egyptian mummy, about as lively and as attractive. So, it is in common. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the narcissist also suffers from extreme separation insecurity, also known colloquially as abandonment anxiety. So the moment you show a sign of independence and autonomy, any, the slightest, a new friend going out for coffee, you, doing something without the narcissist or without his permission, anything, using the smartphone. I mean, any, because when you're with your smartphone, you have a private enclave, a private world. It's very threatening. Mm -hmm. Anything you do would provoke devaluation. Now, why did the narcissist need to devalue you? because you're a source of threat and because you are proof positive that his judgment had been wrong. I mean, he, if he needs to devalue you, then he judged you wrongly, didn't he? So he needs to eliminate you. And he eliminates you by, by claiming that you had changed. There's new information, you had changed somehow, or he found out new things about you, or you went crazy, or you became insufferable or something. There's been a transformation in you that does not vitiate, does not negate his initial judgment of you. You had changed, not the narcissist. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, now that you have changed, he can create 
a negative introject of you. He can create the opposite of the yeah. snapshot. He can create a snapshot that is ugly, that is stupid, that is, and then this justifies discarding you. And that's uh, the last phase. He needs to discard you because your very existence is a threat. And this is what people fail to understand. Narcissistic abuse is not about something you do or something you don't do or choices or decisions or lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Narcissistic abuse is about mm -hmm. getting rid of your existence, killing you in effect, if possible physically, but usually mentally, killing you. Then the discard. Following the discard, you actually there's another phase, which is replacement. The narcissist tries to find an alternative to you and go through the whole process again. The narcissist creates something called shared fantasy. Shared fantasy was first described by Sanger in 1989, not by Wagner. <laughs> and the shared fantasy is a, is a fantastic space where the narcissist can maintain his grandiosity and where he can exert full control over you and negate your agency. So that's the shared fantasy. Shared fantasy also includes fantastic elements like dreams, aspirations, um, a, a, a brilliant rosy future. It could be children, could be family, it could be money, it could be whatever. But So that's a shared fantasy. He drags you into the shared fantasy. And uh, the replacement is simply finding another partner for the shared fantasy. If he fails at the replacement phase, then he switches to phase four, four B, and four B would be hoovering. The hoovering is a last resort, actually. People think that narcissists hoover habitually. They try to avoid it as much as they can. It's a last resort. It's indicative of the narcissist's failure to find a replacement for you. But there is one case where the narcissist will never ever hoover you. And that's if you had mortified the narcissist. In 1957, a group of scholars described a phenomenon in the study of narcissism known as narcissistic mortification. Mm. Narcissistic mortification is when someone, an intimate partner, or shames you and humiliates you in public in front of people you care for, people whose opinions you value. So if I were to create a situation where you are, for example, sitting with your colleagues or with your peers, and then I were to shame you and humiliate you horribly in front of all of them, I will have mortified you. And then narcissists never hover after mortification. Mortification is a fascinating process because what happens is the false self and all the defenses break down, they're inactivated. And the narcissist is faced with his own internal void known as the empty schizoid core. The narcissist is faced with a black hole at his, at his own center. And that's, of course, a harrowing, traumatizing experience. So he will never come near you again. You have the capacity to traumatize him. Is that the same as narcissistic decompensation, Sam? Decompensation is an element in motivation. <clears throat> decompensation simply means, element. yes, decompensation is a clinical term for, for when defense mechanisms, psychological defense mechanisms, are disabled. Mm are disabled. So then they're no longer able to filter and reframe reality in a way which will conform to the narcissist's self-image. So his self-image is assaulted and assailed by numerous countervailing data from reality. And he can't stand that and his false self mm. falls apart. Borderlines, by the way, go through the compensation as well. The disabling of, of these defenses creates a very interesting phenomenon um, and that's that's the crux of my work nowadays, and and it's be, it's becoming widely accepted in academia. I just gave lectures in McGill University about this, and I'm going to give lectures in Cambridge and so. On. I suggested that actually we should consider all personality disorders as an assemblage of self states. So people with personality disorders don't have a, don't have a single self. They have multiple self states. Mm. And then what mm. happens is under stress, under duress, under humiliation, rejection, abandonment, et cetera, et cetera, <clears throat> or when challenged and undermined, for example, by your independent behavior, people with personality disorders switch between self states. So for example, the borderline, mm. borderline if she perceives rejection and abandonment 
which is her greatest fear. If she perceives them, then she decompensates, her defense mechanisms switch off. Mm. And she switches from one self-state, the borderline self-state, to a psychopathic self-state. She becomes a psychopath, uh, more precisely mm. a secondary psychopath. Yeah. So the self-state's argument or the self-state's mo model is a fascinating model, in effect. Because first of all, it allows us to unify all personality disorders. We just say, okay, there is a, a limited set set of self states, mm -hmm. and these apply to borderline, these apply to narcissism, and also it means that when the narcissist switches to another self state, he can easily become covert or a borderline, or he can become a psychopath, or a psychopath can become a narcissist, or he can become a borderline. I mean, it, it opens up the, the field. It, it allows for all these transitions that had been observed in therapy and in clinical settings, but were not accounted for by the DSM and other categorical texts. So it's much more fluid. You know, getting back to the Hoover, Sam, <clears throat> the last time I spoke, I'd never received a Hoover before. And um, I got one, I think, uh, a year and a half after I left the relationship. And it was the most bizarre, disturbing experience. And I think um, it's really important for, for, for people to hear is that as the person just arrived at my house, I firstly was very nervous. And secondly, I felt as if there were walls of steel around me. And I kept having to remind myself of who and what was in front of me. And all the charm was switched on, you know. It, and right at the end, I saw a reptilian intelligence there, a sly intelligence. And I thought of a, a black mamba striking a mouse or a king cobra striking a mouse, which is very primal. And the, the snake doesn't do it because there's anything wrong with the snake. That is the design of the snake. There's no empathy for that poor mouse that's going to suffer. And that's what I felt right at the end. It, it, was, it was this sly intelligence and she knew exactly what she was doing. That was the other thing that horrified me. And, you know, when, when people experience the Hoover, it's very hard to resist from, from my perspective because I love the person and because it looked, it was a fantastic show, but I hadn't experienced it the last time we spoke and now I have. And all I can say is it was difficult to resist, but I'm very glad that I did. I did not allow myself to be drawn back in. And I think that's very important that people can be, you know, and also, I was thinking that when I left the person, I joined a, a group of, for narcissistic abuse survivors. And the person that I started speaking to, um, he had to plan his exit. Over a year, he planned it because he was married, they shared money, etc. I didn't do that. I could just leave this person. I just packed up and I left. I didn't know who she was. I just left. But, but he had to plan it. And you've said this before many times, Sam. It's very hard to leave. Yeah. It's very hard to leave. Covering involves two, two mechanisms. One is triggering. The very presence of the, of the narcissist triggers you. Uh, you, <coughs> had been, you had been traumatized by the narcissist on the one hand, so it triggers the trauma. Mm. But it also triggers the good memories. It's not only the bad yeah. memories. Yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. triggering of the entire panoply of memories and emotions that are involved <clears throat> in the relationship. And by the way, that is common for healthy relationships. I mean, if you were to divorce yes. a perfectly healthy person and she would, you would, she would see her again, you would be triggered. You would be, but in the case yeah. of the narcissist, in the case of the narcissist, the triggering uh, disables you because it also triggers the trauma. So you have a post-traumatic response, you know, freeze, freeze, fight, fight, flight, form, all this. Mm. So you have all it's panoply, post-traumatic responses. This is the trigger. And the second thing that hovering does, it entices you, it entices you because you see what happens typical, with typical victims of narcissists, what happens is a process called merger and fusion. Merger and fusion when you either willingly surrender your boundaries or you never had boundaries to start with, you're codependent, for example. Yeah. yeah. And so you merge, you become one organism with a narcissist. You become a single unit, uh, a, a, a cerebrus with two heads, you know, 
Uh, and so, uh, when the narcissist abandons you, you abandon the narcissist, it's the equivalent of an amputation. And you have a phantom limb left behind. It's yeah. like I'm, I would amputate yeah. your leg, but you would still feel your leg. Yeah. Yeah. You'd still feel the narcissist there. There's a phantom narcissist left behind yeah. because you were one, you were a single entity. Mm. And leaving the narcissist made you half. And you will always be half without her. She will always be there as a phantom. She will be there more clinically as an introject. She's in your mind, she's in your head, she talks to you. Even if you don't realize it, even if you're not aware, she is there. She had penetrated, she had mind snatched you and then body snatched you. And she had merged with you. It's like the alien movies when the alien enters a body. You know? yeah. And then yeah. from the outside, it looks like Sam Vaknin, but actually it's an alien from, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so hoovering, Hoovering seems to be like a, this kind of trivial, trivial pursuit, if you wish. You know, someone, yeah. an ex tries to pick you up. No way. It's an exceedingly complex psychodynamic uh, or psychological process, exceedingly. It involves multiple disciplines in psychology. It's, it's one of the most understudied and amazing phenomena in psychology. <clears throat> and you as a codependent or you as someone with poor boundaries or you as a boundary person who has surrendered your boundaries or you who had struck the Faustian mm -hmm. deal yeah give me a second chance and in return i will kill myself for a while or suspend myself for a while if you had done any of this and you had because you had a relationship with the narcissist if you had done any of this you would be sorely tempted and here's another reason it's much easier to be dead than to be alive it's anxiety reducing. We all live in a state of anxiety. And anxiety yeah. is provoked by life. But when you suspend your existence, when you're no longer alive, there is a sense of calm. I know it sounds bizarre because victims are always traumatized and they are anxious and they're depressed on the one hand. Mm. But on the other hand, handing control to the narcissist has, has merits. In, in terms of being, feeling safe, feeling in a way that you're in good hands. So this is, this is the dynamic that works with dictators. Dictators like Ad Adolf Hitler, you know? His message was, let me manage everything. Don't worry, you have no responsibility and no accountability. I become the external locus of control. And that leads us yeah. to the concept this leads us to the concept of external locus of control. In a relationship with the narcissist, your life is controlled from the outside. You have an external locus. And so you are never to blame. You're never guilty. You're never responsible, never accountable, as long as you play the game with the narcissist, as long as you conform. I remember all those feelings, Sam. Exactly what you're describing. <clears throat> there was a great sense of safety and peace in being with the person i i i, I get you completely you know maybe another concept Same, uh, to, another concept mm. to in, in inject here uh, would be the comfort zone <clears throat> people who end up with narcissists usually default to a comfort zone and this comfort zone reflects mm. something in childhood so maybe they were not allowed to separate in childhood and to become individuals mm. the parent emotionally blackmailed them or there was emotional ambient incest or i don't know what and they couldn't separate and individuate so here's an opportunity to again not separate so this is a comfort zone maybe they have been abused as children and so they gravitate to the narcissist because because she is an abuser i mean that's the job qualification she's an abuser and so you need to recreate the comfort zone of having been abused now what is a comfort zone comfort zone is not positive or negative actually most comfort zones are negative Comfort zone is simply a way of existence where you feel that you know the rules, you know the ropes, everything is predictable, and you can control the process. Yeah. That's a comfort zone. Now, we have studies that show that women who had been abused, battered, beaten up in childhood by, for example, fa their fathers, tend overwhelmingly to select uh, abusers as partners. 
because they know how to cope with an abuser. They know how to predict his reactions. You know. It's familiar. You know, Sam, I, in the book, in my book, I describe being with somebody who did not, does not exist. All that existed was a mask that, that uh, 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 danced and gleamed with portrayals of authenticity, kindness, and personality. And I got that from you because you said that there is actually nobody there. Yes. And so when I, when I think about her now, I think um, I shared so many special moments. We traveled to a lot of countries and so on. But there was nothing from her side. And I think that's a difficulty for, for, for us, as I, I call myself a survivor of narcissistic abuse. And you actually said this in one of your lectures in London, I think, with Richard. You said the most difficult thing for you to understand is that none of you are special to us. That's what you said, I remember. Most oh. difficult thing. Yeah. yeah. That, that in her mind, I, I'm, I'm a, 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 just a different make of toaster or a different make of car or a different make of cell phone. There's nothing special about me at all, too. To her. You're, you're interchangeable, yes. The interchangeable units. They're, those were the, the terms that yes. you used. Um, and I think also, Sam, that in the beginning, and we did touch on this a little bit earlier, is that I would say, if I was this person, I wouldn't have behaved in that way. And then I realized that was a fatal error. I had to look at it from the perspective of the narcissist. And you were talking about the, the breakdown of language earlier. Adolf Hitler thought that what he was doing was right. So that's his perspective. In my perspective, you shouldn't go and kill people like that. But that's his perspective. I've just been busy reading a book about Jonestown, about Jim Jones, and listening to how he killed all those people. From his perspective, he was what he was them. doing was okay. Was okay. He was saving them. He was saving them. Yeah. So I think if we, if, if we look at it from, if I look at it from my perspective, it doesn't make any sense. But if I look at it from the perspective of the narcissist, it makes complete sense. Who's right and who's wrong? Maybe it isn't a question of that. It's a question of what's okay for me and what's not okay for me as, as, as each person. Yeah? It is definitely wrong to convert the discourse on narcissism to a morality play. Good versus evil. Yes. Good yes. versus evil. Right versus wrong. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's very wrong, and it's it leads leads people astray because they become angels, and the, the narcissist is a devil, and you know it's, it becomes highly religious. And do you, and do, it's do you think angel. I'm an angel? Yeah, do you think I'm an angel, Sam? Do I look like an angel? Of course, you're not an angel. No one is. No one is. And, exactly. Um, exactly. And it's not about being the devil. Remember the simple principle: the narcissist yeah. knows no better. He wants to do to you what had been done to him because he considers yeah. himself. Because yeah. he considers himself su superior. He wants to elevate yeah. you to his level. I'm doing you a favor to be in my company, to share my life yeah. with me, to make love to me. It's enormous privilege because I'm yeah. a unique being. I'm a superior, I'm a light being, you know, I'm a superior creature. And I want to do to you what had been done to me because that way you will become me. And by yeah. and I'm elevating you to my level when I'm making you me, when I'm making you a clone of me, a replica of me, I'm doing you a favor and a once in a lifetime favor. Now, what had been done to me? First of all, I was not allowed to separate. So I'm not, I will not allow you to separate. I will not allow you to make this horrible mistake of becoming an individual. <laughs> Second mm. thing, I was hollowed out. I was hollowed out. I was rendered into an, a void and emptiness. It's called the empty schizoid core in clinical terms. I became an emptiness. But I don't consider this a disadvantage. I consider this the next step in the evolutionary ladder. This mm. is what renders me superior. <clears throat> and so I want to empty you. I want to hollow you out also. Because I want to bring yeah. you to, I want to bring you to the tribe. I want you to share my superiority. I love you. I, this is love, isn't it? Love is about elevating the partner, allowing the partner to grow and to develop. So this is self-development. This is self-growth, what I'm doing to you. 
So I'm empty, you should be empty. I have no boundaries, you should have no boundaries. I've been, I have been abused. I will abuse you because abuse had been proven to be a methodology which had led to superiority. I call mm. it, I will call it probably tough love or something, you know? So this is what people, the narcissist intentions, and that's the irony. The narcissist, first of all, is selfless. He has no self, <laughs> literally has no self. That's why he needs input from the outside. He has no functioning self. That's one thing. And the second thing is the narcissist is well-intentioned, not evil. That's the psychopath. The psychopath is evil. The narcissist yeah. is well-intentioned. He believes, he believes that together you can become this amazing single unit that is by definition far more advanced than the rest of humanity. But unfortunately, you are not at this step of evolution. He needs to bring you up to him. Right. That's, that's a good summary of relationships with the narcissist. They try to educate you, edify you, improve you, change you, transform you, help you. I mean, they try all the time to make you who you are not, to take away your identity because it sucks your identity. Better to adopt the narcissist. You know, it, it's easy for me to, to hear all of this now, Sam, <clears throat> but not in the beginning of my journey. So in the beginning, I hated the person and I hated what I'd become, a shell of my former self. And only, you know, a long time, many years later, can I discuss it like this with you because there's distance from it now. But the people, uh, I sort of speaking to so many people about it, some of my clients, I mean, my travel agent planned her own suicide. Um, uh, an old friend of mine, goes into a clinic for depression once a year because her husband is a narcissist. So from our side, it's, it's so inconceivable in the beginning. I think, well, because I have emotional empathy that everyone else is going to have it. I didn't realize that some people just don't have it. So it's very difficult for us to understand and achieve distance, to say, I understand how the narcissist works. But it really destroys us. It's it's so dangerous for us. I mean, an, an, an ex girlfriend of mine from thirty years ago was married to a psychopath, and she said to me recently that she had planned. Oops, you froze, Charles. I don't know if you can hear me. Sam, are you there? Yes, I can yes. hear you now. You froze. You said a friend of mine had planned, and then you vanished. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, she was married to a psychopath for, I think, uh, maybe about 10 years. And then she was so unhappy that she had asked somebody to, uh, to kill her, take mm. a hit out on her. So what I'm, I mean, you, you know this better than I do, Sam, the damage that, 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 that it does. So that's the only reason I can speak about it now with a sense of humor and, and more distant, you know. What, what would you say to people who, who are in a relationship with a narcissist? Don't what be. would your advice be, Sam? Don't be right. <laughs> Honestly, all the rest is bullshit. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of bullshit on that. Do this, do that. I invented most of this bullshit, by the way. I came up with mirroring and with, you name it. <laughs> I yeah. came up with, with seven of eight techniques. The only technique I did not come up with is gray rock. So gray rock is not my invention. But all the rest, <coughs> what you hear about, I mean, it's, I invented. And yet I'm telling you, they're all bullshit. The, the only viable uh, solution save your life, get away, no contact. And no contact means no contact, no texts, no social media stalking, yeah. no, no gifts, no third party introductions, no flying monkey, no, none, no contact. No attempts because the brain, the brain plays tricks on you. It would come up with a million reasons why yes to be in contact only once for a few minutes. It's just once for a few minutes. And there's excellent reason for it. There's an excellent reason. And one of the main, of course, alibis is having common children or common property. Yeah. Or it's my mother. How could I give up on her? Or it's my child. It's my son. How can I give up on him? You know? These are all excuses. And I don't yeah. have money. I don't have money. It's an excuse. You don't have money. It's an excuse. 
You have common children, it's an excuse. It's your mother, it's an excuse. They're all excuses. Now, of course, some departures are much more complex than others, but departure is, it must be one way or another. You have common children, let your attorneys communicate. He has to pick them up, don't be there. Ask your cousin to be there. If there is visitation, make them supervised, or ask someone to be there. I mean, find a solution, no contact. He wants to talk to you, he cannot talk to you. You have a lawyer, or you have a neighbor, I don't know, or you have a good friend. It's your mother, walk away. She is your enemy. She threatens your life. Walk away. Why do people but, why do people not consider narcissists as, as life threatening? They are. It's not that narcissists are, are life threatening because of their practices. Narcissists are life threatening because it's you or, or them. It's, if you are alive, the narcissist's life is threatened. At least mental life. Yeah. If he is alive, he needs you to be dead. He will offer you a lot for this. I mean, it's a bargain. <laughs> It's a bargain death. He will offer you a lot to stop to exist. But he needs you to stop to exist. It's you or him. You or her. The final invoice, and I think I got this from you too, Sam. The final invoice is for our life. That's you. That's in my book too. The final invoice from the narcissist is for our life, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, my own no contact has been in place ever since I discovered who and what she was. Completely blocked, never looked for her on Facebook. I speak to nobody who, you know, just completely no contact. And that's the, because Sam, apart from the risk of, 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 of getting back together again, I would like to believe I'm strong enough now. Um, it's also like, um, as an alcoholic, having one drink, it's not okay. It's the same principle. And the other thing, Sam, if I talk to my abuser, I'm giving the signal to myself that what the person did is okay. And it's not okay. It's the same as if I come to your house and you open the door, you please see me and I start punching you. What are you going to do? Hit me back, close the door. That's what you should do, right? So the message is, if I talk, if I'm in contact with my abuser, I'm saying to me, it's not okay. And, and you know, the other thing, Sam, when I, when I left the person, I thought I got the better of her, but I didn't. I got the better of myself. That's what I did. I beat myself because that's, that was the war, which is, which is what you've been speaking about, is that, that, that battle to leave. You know what I mean? The, the, the difficulty in leaving. So, Sam, is there anything, any other advice I mean, yeah. just before you answer, you know, again, I'm, I'm not saying it probably for the third time, but people that I know, whether they're clients, friends, etc., the majority of them do not leave. I know I did, and I know that this friend of mine, he left, the one who planned his exit over a year. It, is, is that in your experience too, that most people don't leave? They not, not only do not leave, but they re-victimize. They they keep selecting <laughs> mates which are replicas of the of the of the narcissist. Right, right. So we have like serial serial victim victimhood or serial. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, this, my third husband were, were, is as narcissistic as my second husband, who was even worse than my first husband. And why you? Why, why do you keep choosing these people? You know, but. It's conditioning, we know, childhood conditioning and so on. Yes, there was more, one more piece of advice. Yes. The narcissist is a wily, wily animal, uh, enemy. He picks up on your body language. He picks up on your facial micro expressions. Yeah. He, pick, he picks up on words you say, but much more importantly, he picks up on words that you do not say. Anything can and will be used against you in due time. Confidences you shared, emotions witnessed, facial expressions, hunched, a hunched shoulder, a twitching leg, a, a tick, anything and everything is catalogued 
observed, cataloged for future use yeah. and future abuse. That's the main reason for no contact. Because every minute you spend with the narcissist is providing is equivalent to providing the narcissist with ammunition for a future battle. You are giving ammunition to your enemy. And he is going to use it. Don't kid yourself. It's like yeah. the United States equipped the Mujahideen at the time. It came back to, to bite them in the ass at 9-11. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You are giving weapons to your enemy. And trust me, uh, I'm, I happen to be a narcissist. Had I decided to victimize you, had, had you been in my crosshairs, in this session alone, <clears throat> I have enough ammunition to ruin you for good. For good, and I mean for good. To render you utterly discombobulating, psychotic in a mental ward for the rest of your life. And that's in 45 minutes. Now, I happen to be a super intelligent narcissist. This is the most dangerous kind and also a psychopathic narcissist. But even a run-of-the-mill pedestrian narcissist would do a, a job 50% as, as good as mine. That's... <laughs> also exceedingly dangerous. And, and, and I'd like to add to that, Sam, that the person that I was with was not bright. Yeah. But boy, boy, was she good at what she did. Yeah, exactly. I, I, with, 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 with my background in psychology and being in therapy, I, I, I thought I was losing my mind. Most tigers... I thought I was losing. I heard that most tigers <clears throat> score, score very low on IQ tests. I heard so. But you wouldn't take the risk, mm. would you, with a tiger? Narcissists no. are, op nar narcissists are optimized, optimized predatory systems. The H word counts here. Optimize predatory, yeah. predatory systems. They're not a human being. They're a hive mind. They're a, a collage of hundreds of minds. It's, it's uh, like a colony. Narcissist, the narcissist is like a colony. Mm. It's like a killer bee colony, you know, and you're feeding it with information. Things you say, things you don't say, body language, this, that, you're feeding it with mm. information. And it's coming at you. Make no mistake. It's coming at you. And it's going to devour you and leave nothing, be nothing behind. And it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's, it has to do with reflexes and instincts. It's primordial, it's primeval, it's primitive. It's not on the level of uh, Nietzsche and, and Schopenhauer and Hegel, you know? It's tooth and claw. It's nail, it's nail and claw and tooth. It's red in nail and toe and cloth. It's, it's nature. It's a predator. It, it's, in, it's interesting, Sam, because I've watched a lot of documentaries on black mambas. <clears throat> and the black mamba is obviously extremely venomous. But it is also highly unpredictable. It's a very skittish defensive snake. So when I watch snake handlers swim with king cobras, which are also very deadly, they're fine. But when you watch a snake handler dealing with a black mamba, they sweat because they know that this attack can come out of nowhere. Now, that's not the fault of the black mamba. That is the design. And if we look at uh, Maslow's hierarchical theory of needs, that's right down at the bottom. That snake, that black mamba is not self-actualizing. That's what it's designed to do. And I see that the same way with, with the narcissist, that it's a primal, it's a very primal level. And with the black mamba, the only thing to do it comes into your no contact is to keep away from them. Yeah. Keep away from them because they're dangerous. I'll it's give you the one, fault of the snake. I'll give you one concluding yes. line. Yes. Narcissists are Predators who feed on other people's autonomy, other people's separateness. Hold on for a second. Right. I open the door. Yeah. I'm sorry. I had to open the no door. Problem. Yeah. Oh, no problem. No problem. So narcissists are, are, narcissists suck other people's autonomy, other people's separateness. Mm. The, I think that's the main feeding mechanism of, of narcissists. 
they they are kind of supernatural being, if you wish, animals that go around and when they see that you're autonomous and separate, they suck it out of you. And narcissists are very good at creating crowds and mobs and masses mm -hmm. throughout history. The great leaders of, of mobs and crowds, or clocracies, yes, ruled by mob, mob rule, were narcissists, of course. Adolf Hitler comes to mind, and much less malevolent and pernicious, Donald Trump. These are narcissists. What they do is they suck the autonomy and separateness of people and render them into a mass, indistinguishable mass. That's what the narcissist does to you. It renders you protoplasmic. It, it takes you back to the beginning of life, in effect. And you're fighting for your life. That's what it felt like, Sam. So basically what you're saying is, when I said, what's your advice if you're involved with one, get away. No contact. Only. My only advice. Get away. Don't bother with all these techniques. These techniques <clears throat> are, are just ways for you to stay. You're trying to convince yourself to stay. So you say, well, there's a way to manage it. It's manageable. Don't worry. I, oh, great rock. Yeah, sure. I can manage it. This is nonsense. You can't fight the narcissist. Narcissist is a superior apex predator. <laughs> there's no way you can, you can survive this. Who doesn't care about what he or she has to do to win. Doesn't care. Predators don't care. Last time I spoke to a COVID-19 virus, he didn't seem to care. It didn't. It didn't have too much compassion, did it? It didn't have compassion and, and so on. <laughs> also, it was not highly intelligent, as far as I could see. But it's it's I efficacious. Don't... It killed six million people. You know, like another virus Sam, I... with a mustache. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I I really want to, you know, thank you again for your time on a Sunday afternoon and Always just to pleasure. acknowledge. I know I've said this in emails, but I'm going to say it again that. And when you when the book is is finally out, you will obviously get mailed a copy, and I'm afraid you're going to find yourself all over it. So thank you for your <laughs> for all all of your your contributions. Narcissist wet, wet so, dream. Thank you. Well, precisely. <laughs> thank you, thank Sam. You. Charles, always good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Cheers for now, Sam. Don't be a stranger. Bye. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye.